investigation it did, the EEOC finds reasonable cause to believe that the allegations of the charge are true, uh, or else it does not. If it finds that there is cause, the EEOC then invites the parties to conciliate and resolve the matter, or the EEOC, uh, if that conciliation fails, the EEOC can then file suit uh, and uh, try to uh, obtain relief based upon the information in the charge. Now, the EEOC and all other federal enforcement agencies file only between four and 500 lawsuits per year in federal district courts. That means that about 20,500 are filed by private parties. Uh, the, uh, if there is no suit by the EEOC in a reasonable cause case, the EEOC issues a notice of right to sue. If the EEOC concludes its process and uh, cannot determine that there is cause, it issues a notice of right to sue there is a substantial amount of litigation taking place about what happens when the EEOC has not had the charge for the full 180 days contemplated by the statute and it has not completed its process and the charging party requests an early notice of right to sue. Now after the 180 days are up or after the EEOC completes its process it's clear the charging party can get the right to sue but there is a split among the circuits about the consequences of an early notice of right to sue when neither of those conditions have been satisfied. Um, when a right to sue is received by the individual, uh, then the individual has 90 days to file suit in federal court. Uh, unfortunately, the EEOC has delegated to individual offices the question whether it provides certified mail uh, notice of a right to sue so that there is a documentation of when the individual received it. In some offices that do not do that, there then can be litigation about exactly when the notice of right to sue was received. How the charge gets drafted uh, is interesting. Uh, usually the EEOC drafts the charge based upon the information provided by the charging party. And sometimes there are problems in that because the first contact can be months before the meeting at which the charge is drafted. Sometimes the attorneys draft the charge, and sometimes the office does not like to accept that. Some offices have a policy of uh, not having very many details in the charge and insisting that the details be placed in a questionnaire. And then the question is, is the information in the questionnaire part of the charge so that the individual has credit for exhausting as to that practice? Sometimes the employer does not receive the questionnaire, so it does not have the notice not received by the employer, it's pretty hard to argue that it's part of the charge <laughs> since the statute requires that the charge be served on the employer. Well, unfortunately, there's also another doctrine. Fortunately for plaintiffs, there's also another <laughs> doctrine that the plaintiff is not charged with the mistakes and lack of diligence of the EEOC. Some of the decisions rest upon whether the individual has uh, uh, sworn to the information that is on the questionnaire and have not addressed the question of whether the employer got notice. Clearly, Congress intended, though, employers should get notice, and there's a reason for that. Now. The situation gets a little bit more involved because we have deferral agencies. Uh, deferral agencies are state or local agencies that are charged with the responsibility of trying to investigate uh, uh, charges of employment discrimination, and part of the EEOC's budget goes to fund those. There are often work-sharing agreements between the EEOC and those agencies so that a charge filed with one is considered dual filed that's also filed with the other one. Now, some of the specifics of uh, the exhaustion requirement there's obviously a lot more information than we can give you in the course of this presentation, uh, but there are sources available to look uh, further. And I'm going to try to follow quickly the old rules of newspaper editors that the first paragraph should have the who, what, where, when, how, and why. Uh, <coughs> what has to be exhausted? Title VII, uh, ADA, ADEA, charges have to be filed. This is not a jurisdictional requirement. It's subject to waiver and equitable estoppel. For Section 1983, there's no exhaustion requirement. What has to be exhausted? Well, the basis on which you're claiming discrimination, generally if you claim age discrimination, you're not going to be allowed to sue about racial discrimination. There is an exception sometimes uh, where the charging party could not know the basis of discrimination, and it's the same practice. For example, if a denial of promotion occurred because of gender discrimination and the charging party thought it was national origin or vice versa, the old Sanchez versus Standard Brands decision is accepted in most car courts the charging party is protected. But what if the charging party sues because of denial of promotion and then uh, later on wants to sue because of discharge and there's no claim of retaliation? Ordinarily the courts will not allow the discharge claim to be brought because it was not exhausted before the EEOC.
The one example of post-charge discrimination that is generally accepted by the courts is post-charge retaliation. Uh, the courts assume that retaliation is going to occur often enough, there's no need to go back to the EEOC, but if the retaliation had already occurred at the time of the charge, the employer, the employee can uh, sue for retaliation only if it's included inside the charge. Evidence does not have to be exhausted. The, uh, a charge can be very narrow and it can assert a claim of discrimination only as to one denial of promotion. And the individual then may have a future promotional problem. Generally, that's not going to be allowed to be raised in the court case because the individual limited the charge to just the uh, uh, one instance of uh, discrimination. There is a general doctrine that most charges are drafted by laypersons, so if they do not have counsel in particular, the courts are a little bit more generous in construing the charge than they would be otherwise. But Rick, as you said, in many offices, it's the EEOC that's drafting the charge, so query whether that doctrine should really apply. <laughs> One can raise that with the courts, but that's not the way that the decisions have gone. Um, uh, <clears throat> against whom must there be exhaustion? Uh, sometimes there are defendants in a court case that were not named in the court charge. Whether they can be included in the case depends upon whether they had notice, uh, whether they would reasonably understand that the charge would have been made against them, whether they'd engaged in actions that led to confusion as to who it was that was responsible, that type of thing. Who has to exhaust? If you have a and situation... An opportunity to conciliate, because that's one of the bases of the statute. That's right, that's right. Uh, <clears throat> who has to exhaust? Uh, there is a doctrine called the single filing doctrine, uh, holding that if one individual goes before the EEOC alleging a practice that affected several individuals, and uh, the employer was unwilling to uh, conciliate with respect to that, and it's been broadened, over, uh, it had the opportunity to conciliate whether or not conciliation ever occurred, other individuals affected by the same practice uh, may be able to bring suit based upon the original person's charge. How long does a person have to exhaust? Well, it's not forever. If there is no deferral agency, there's a 180-day period for filing a charge under the uh, Title VII or the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. If there is a deferral agency, there's 300 days, but 60 of those days are in a special, potentially vanishing category. <laughs> um, if the, the statute says that the deferral agency has a maximum of 60 days to consider the charge, if the deferral agency waives that, then the individual has 300 days to file the charge with the EEOC. What starts the time running to take all of these actions? When the individual is notified that there's going to be an adverse employment action, the person cannot wait for the action to take place. Correct. Do, okay. There is a difference between an employment action that a person is notified about uh, that is final and subject to reconsideration, and that starts the time running. The individual may grieve about it in a collective bargaining situation. That does not toll the time. The time is still running. But if the uh, action is not final at the time uh, and it's got to go through some further processing inside to be final, then the time does not necessarily start to run. Uh, not everything can be the subject of a suit. A performance evaluation, for example, that has no adverse consequences generally held to be something that cannot uh, be sued upon. But supposing the performance evaluation was discriminatory, it's relied on later as a basis for uh, uh, a further action that can be sued on, then it could be challenged at that time. There is not time to get into the continuing effect cases and continuing violation cases. Uh, the Supreme Court has a case involving continuing violations, and this term will get more guidance about that. That's uh, the Morgan case against uh, National Railroad Passenger Corporation. The federal sector is completely different. Unfortunately, there's not very much time to get into the federal sector. One thing I, I would mention before we move on, uh, there was a very important 11th Circuit decision, I think, in May of this year in HIP versus Liberty National on the single filing or piggyback doctrine. It was under an age case, but the case law applies age decisions to Title VII and vice versa. And I think for any of the uh, law clerks who are, who are tasked with, with looking into that issue, the, the application of single filing, uh, that's probably as, as recent a pronouncement as there is on the subject. Um, uh, let me take less than 60 seconds to talk about four major differences in the federal sector. One is that if one is seeking compensatory damages, one has to exhaust it in the federal sector. That's a Supreme Court decision, Gibson versus West, recently handed down. There's only 45 days to file a charge in the federal sector. The EEOC and the agency charged engage in an actual adjudication process with decisions, and the agency, but not the individual, is bound by the result of that. So an individual can go to court to seek further relief,
uh, based upon the agency findings of discrimination. Uh, but if the individual chooses, the individual can go to court for uh, de novo litigation. Finally, in the last 90 seconds or so for this uh, segment, there are several bars to suit. One of them, judicial estoppel, has been largely resolved by the Supreme Court's uh, decision uh, in the Cleveland case. Uh, basically, if an individual applies for disability benefits, social security benefits, disability insurance, and represents total disability, unable to work, uh, but then files a claim under the Americans with Disabilities Act in which they have to show that they are otherwise qualified to perform, uh, they're not automatically knocked out of court, but there's a very heavy burden of explanation that falls upon them uh, to uh, uh, explain how their representations are consistent. And remember, with respect to disability insurance and benefits, there's no reasonable accommodation. So some individuals can survive, uh, many do not. Uh, I think at this point we need to turn over to Mark to talk about process. Okay. Um, let me start first by talking about discovery and, and focusing really on what um, may be different about discovery and employment discrimination litigation from the, the more general discovery rules. Uh, one word of, of caution here, just as Wendy uh, talked about and I'll talk about also, the significant change in, in the discrimination laws in 1991. We also had a significant change in the rules affecting discovery effective December 1 of, of last year. Um, and because of that, uh, much of the precedent may be impacted, so there needs to be a cautionary note about cases prior to that time on discovery. Um, most of the discovery in employment cases is discovery by the the plaintiff, the employee, against the employer. Because in most cases, it's the employer that has the records and information, has the explanations for the employment decision um, or action in question. Why did they hire someone? Why did they fire someone? How was the pay determined? Um, the kinds of information that are sought relate to comparators. Um, goes beyond what we'll talk about in a moment in evidence about just individuals who meet a test of being similarly situated, but other employees, other employees who may be either similar to the plaintiff or who may have allegedly suffered similar types of discrimination. Statistical evidence becomes a major part um, in employment discrimination litigation, and uh, today much of that's in electronic form, so much, many of the traditional disputes over electronic evidence discovery also take place with respect to employment discrimination cases, including uh, issues of the cost and burden of assembling um, electronic evidence. Mode of evidence is another issue in employment discrimination because, as you heard, it's not just an issue of adverse employment action, but was it um, based on a, pro a protected um, status of the individual, race, gender, etc. So you need to get into what was the motive of the employer for taking that uh, action. And that, again, may deal with either statements that an employer or managers may have made uh, that may show evidence of bias or the treatment of others um, in similar categories. Um, with respect to sexual harassment, you also have, as, um, as mentioned before, the issues of how the employer has responded um, to other complaints of harassment, both to that employee and other employees and their policies. Um, from the employee, discovery by the employer against the employee, uh, usually has fairly limited discovery in the form of document discovery, whereas on the employer side, it's usually heavily on the document side, the employee rarely has very many documents with respect to their case. Um, it may go um, as to the reasons they believe there, there is discrimination issues about their qualifications. One area where discovery from the, the plaintiff is, is very significant from the employer is in sexual harassment cases because as distinguished from cases where the employers made the decision about hiring or promotion, in the sexual harassment case, the employer may not know at all what the basis of the allegations of the uh, claimant are in terms of the sexual harassment. The area of damages, uh, both in terms of mitigation, which Wendy talked about, um, um, as well as the components of damages, including emotional distress, are areas where the employer would have extensive um, discovery uh, requests. In, this, the, in discovery, um, statistical evidence presents particular issues. Um, statistical evidence is critical in cases involving pattern and practice, almost always a, an issue in those kinds of cases, and cases involving a disparate impact where you're trying to show that a given policy had an adverse impact on a protected group of individuals. Um, the, as more and more evidence is moved into the electronic form, um, issues about record retention uh, in terms of what form it's kept in, um, some information being kept electronically, some being kept um, in hard copy, uh, all of those raise extensive issues 
um, for discovery. The kinds of discovery disputes that, that arise in terms of the scope of the discovery can be put into, um, in, in some ways, four categories. First, you have the temporal issue. That is, how far back can discovery go? You have someone who says, I was fired six months ago. Can you get information about other individuals who are arguably similarly situated going back two years, five years, ten years? Um, there's no hard and fast rule, although there's probably a dividing line that, that sort of accepts discovery going back two, three, maybe up to five years and rejecting discovery, absent some basis for it going back much further than that. Um, next um, area is with respect to the geographic scope of, of employment. And assume for the purposes of this, you've got an employer that has multiple plants, multiple offices, multiple facilities. Um, to what facilities should that discovery be limited? In fact, even within that facility, uh, should it be limited to the department in which the individual worked? Should it be limited to their particular supervisor? Um, um, or should it be broader? This will in part depend upon what's being challenged. If you're talking about an individual termination decision by an individual supervisor based on uh, race or gender, for example, then it will be hard for plaintiffs to justify they ought to get information with respect to terminations um, of other employees by other supervisors, even in the same facility. On the other hand, if you're challenging a policy which has broader implication, a sexual harassment case where the question of how the company has responded generally to those, then you may have a basis for a broader um, discovery in that area. Um, I should say that plaintiffs are not going to know whether there's something idiosyncratic about the individual supervisor or whether it is a policy unless they have the broader discovery. So that's the argument that plaintiffs would be using. And again, it will depend upon the, the scope of what's being alleged in that given case. Um, um, and, and it may be in stages. It may be that, that um, the broader discovery may have to wait based on some evidence of that. And that's always the tension between the fishing expeditions um, and, and the obvious burdensomeness of the discovery. Um, the type of claim also will determine the scope of discovery or may determine the scope of discovery. Um, if you have a hiring case uh, versus a pay and promotion uh, case, um, information about other types of claims may simply not be relevant or meet the test for discovery in terms of, uh, of that. On the other hand, plaintiffs will undoubtedly argue if we're trying to show um, motive or bias of a given supervisor or a given company, then the fact that they discriminated against the plaintiff in this case in hiring, evidence that they may have discriminated against others in pay or promotion or termination may be relevant. And that really sets up the sort of conflict that goes on and where you draw that line. Um, an issue that comes up frequently with respect to um, information that is discovered um, leads to the question of confidentiality and protective orders. And it really is an issue on, on both sides, or maybe three sides. Um, you have personal information about the individual plaintiff, who they may want to have protected from public disclosure. It may be medical records, it may be other things about their personal status. You have information that the employer may be concerned about, um, that may be competitive, it may not rise to the level of trade secret, but um, how much they pay employees in a given classification may be competitive information. Their benefit plans may be in some degrees competitive. Certainly their business plans and future plans are certainly uh, competitive information that would need to be protected. Um, the third area is information relating to other employees who are not uh, plaintiffs or defendants in the case. Uh, the personal information about other inf employees in terms of their compensation, um, uh, prior employment, etc. Um, all of those frequently lead to um, negotiated and then court approved protective orders which may um, limit the, the use and disclosure of that information with a sensitivity to all three areas of those concerns. In fact, in some cases, you, you run into in, in employment issues some even more specific issues about confidentiality, about who can see the information, where you have a, a plaintiff who's now gone to work for a direct competitor. Um, can you, in fact, screen that information from the, from the plaintiff as opposed to their lawyer because of the, the adverse consequences of disclosing that information? Um, some special um, issues that arise with respect to discovery um, in employment um, cases. Um, Attorney-client privilege issues um, come up um, uh, many times with respect to 
Um, in sexual harassment cases, for example, the investigation being conducted by a counsel, either outside counsel or in-house counsel, um, it will depend upon if the employer wants to rely on that investigation to show their affirmative defense of having acted properly, they're not going to be able to rely on the privilege with respect to that. There are also unique issues with respect to discovery from the EEOC um, and questions of ex parte communications, that is, dealing um, communications by counsel for the plaintiff, for example, with former managers of the employer and the extent to which they are um, precluded, not purely as a discovery issue, but even but an issue closely related to um, discovery. Um, the unique status of the EEOC also raises discovery issues because of their role as an investigatory agency, sometimes as the plaintiff and sometimes merely as the investigatory agency. There's both FOIA obligations for them to disclose and then broader obligations of, to respond to discovery. Um, the next subject uh, I'm going to address is the issue of summary judgment. Um, and that is an issue um, obviously closely related to the burdens of proof we heard discussed uh, earlier. Um, and there have been a surprising number of um, Supreme Court cases that deal either with the burden of proof um, or um, summary judgment. One would have thought now some um, 35 years after the passage of Title VII, uh, we would have sorted out um, how you go about proving a Title VII case and what are the elements of proof and, and how much evidence does a plaintiff need to either survive summary judgment um, or take their case to the jury. Um, and yet, um, as recent as last term, um, the Supreme Court was once again uh, attempting to redefine um, uh, the standards of proof and for summary judgment. Um, we know, and I assume you're all familiar with the basic um, standards of when summary judgment um, can or should be granted or should not be granted, so I won't go into um, those issues. But um, as Wendy mentioned earlier, um, most courts follow the um, McDonnell Douglas um, both um, order and burden of proof in employment discrimination cases. And that deals with setting up a, a prima facie case, a, a very non onerous burden the employer articulating the reason for its non-discriminatory reason for its employment action, um, and then the plaintiff having an opportunity to show that that reason or reasons um, were a pretext for intentional discrimination. Most cases in both the litigation stage and then the summary judgment stage focus on the question of pretext. And in fact, last term the Supreme Court had an opportunity again to, to address that issue of what is meant and what is necessary at the pretext stage sufficient to establish an inference from which a jury could find discrimination. That's Reeves v. Sanderson plumbing. Um, and basically what the court held is uh, that a jury is permitted to infer discrimination from the falsity of the employer's um, explanation. Not obligated to, doesn't have to, but can merely from the falsity of the employer's explanation find enough to infer discrimination. And of course, if there's enough for the jury to infer discrimination, that means you can't get summary judgment. The employer can't get summary judgment, nor can you get a JNOV or directed verdict. Um, the factors the court articulated uh, to consider in determining whether or not um, there is enough evidence to go to the jury are what's the strength of the prima facie case? Was it a mere bare bones prima facie case? Or was there enough evidence that went beyond the bare bones of the prima facie case? Um, what's the probative value of, of the proof that the explanation was false? Do you have somebody clearly, unequivocally lying that would really suggest they were trying to cover up something? Um, or is it something less than that? And then what other evidence is there to support that the employer's case that it was not a discriminatory reason to make the decision? Um, the, it's important to understand the, and the distinction between false reasons uh, which create the inference of discrimination um, and erroneous reasons. And even not all false reasons are necessarily discriminatory. For example, many supervisors have a hard time um, saying to someone, you really are a poor performer. They might mo feel much more comfortably saying, we needed to reorganize the department or we needed to reduce the size of the workforce. And so they may tell the, the, the employee that when the real reason is performance. And they simply didn't do it to cover up discrimination. They just did it out of what they thought was a good way to put it. In fact, you have law firms doing just the opposite. Um, some have suggested that they are telling associates that they are uh, being terminated for performance when really it may be a fact of reduction in force. Um, again, being done not to cover up discrimination necessarily. But there's a problem when a government enforcement agency is tooled the wrong thing. 
about what the basis for the action is or when one, someone swears to the wrong thing. Yeah, and I think that's a good point. And when we talk about, and, and you really have reasons being given at different stages. You have the reason being given to the employee at the time they're told of this. You have the companies documenting it or not mm -hmm. documenting it in their records. You have the response to the investigation. You have people being deposed about it. And all of those may be grounds for where you may have differences, significant or insignificant. And I'll talk about differences in a minute. It's important to distinguish between um, false reasons and errors or mistakes. False reasons, lies, create a basis for an inference of discrimination. But the fact that the employer who made the decision was mistaken um, doesn't create that same inference. So if an employer or manager thought someone committed a crime and terminated them on that basis, even though it's later proved that they were wrong, that doesn't create the inference of discrimination because it wasn't a pretext, it was simply a mistake they made. Just as if the employer thought someone was better qualified, um, you need to show not merely that they weren't better qualified, but some reason to believe that that wasn't the real reason the employer was using, such as they never even looked at the qualifications. might be a basis um, for, for showing that. Inconsistent reasons also raise questions. Inconsistent, as we just talked about, at various stages in the process. Inconsistencies between the written material, a written documentation, and what's orally said, um, or among different people. It's quite uh, common, in a, in a, particularly in a larger employer, to have multiple people involved in a, an employment deci decision, like a hiring decision or a termination decision or promotion decision. And those individuals, while they reach a common decision to either hire, fire, or promote, may actually have their own individual reasons for making that decision. The fact that they have inconsistent reasons, I thought this person was better qualified, I thought this person had d different skills, we needed to really reduce the workforce, no, I thought it was performance, doesn't necessarily create pretext, but may create pretext and may create the inference of discrimination. One test is, do the inconsistencies go to credibility? If it goes to the credibility of the decision maker, that certainly provides a much stronger basis for inferring both discrimination and with respect to other issues. Where you have multiple reasons being articulated, and when we talk about articulate the non-discriminatory reason, an employer may have multiple reasons. I terminated the employee both for absenteeism and poor performance um, um, and because they of insubordination. Um, if the employee, is that, or the plaintiff in this case, is able to show that as to one or maybe two of those reasons, um, they were false. I really didn't have as bad a, an attendance record, and I really didn't uh, shout at my supervisor. But uh, is unable to show pretext with respect to the poor performance, that probably is not going to be enough. Because as long as the employer has, can articulate a reason for its decision that is non-discriminatory, the fact that other reasons may be unable to be substantiated is not sufficient for the plaintiff. Except, of course, when the uh, credibility of the supervisor is uh, jeopardized yes. by the plaintiff showing as to the one reasons. They may not have anything to point to the poor performance, but if the supervisor is the same one whose credibility has been damaged in the other area, right. they may be, the plaintiff may be able to escape. Yes, and I think that's, that shows some of the complexity um, in this area. Um, it's also, um, when you're talking about showing evidence of, of bias, um, or motive, uh, one of the areas, of course, is comments. You heard reference to that uh, earlier, whether they're age, race, or gender comments. Um, courts have, have looked at those in sort of two categories. They put them either in the category of, of um, evidence of bias, in fact, sometimes direct evidence of bias based on the statements, and sometimes stray remarks. Uh, in fact, stray remarks that may be in, even inadmissible because they're prejudi prejudicial. It's impossible to categorize any given set of remarks on one side or the other because you will find cases on both sides taking exactly the same remark and saying it's either inadmissible um, as a stray remark or it's direct evidence of uh, discrimination. Um, in fact, if a statement is subject to a, a double meaning, uh, it may in fact raise a jury question and therefore not uh, permit um, summary judgment in that uh, case. Um, uh, a brief comment about uh, sort of the procedure on, on summary judgment because again, not the general rules, um, but as unique to employment um, areas, um, where the moving party, uh, typically the employer, but not always, um, uh, sets forth a set of facts which they claim are material and, um, and not disputed, the burden may shift to the plaintiff to, to show that those um, um, facts really are, um, in fact, in dispute. And they have to do that not through um, um, simply their belief or subjective belief, but show actual um, admissible evidence, someone with personal knowledge that can put those issues in fact, or show that they need further discovery to do that. 
Um, the EOC's reasonable cause um, determination is typically not sufficient because, as described by the process, to show um, a basis to defeat a summary judgment motion um, in that regard. This is all closely related to the subject of um, types of evidence that are um, ad both admitted and precluded from admission in employment discrimination litigation. And again, another caution. Prior to 1991 um, amendments to the Civil Rights Act, and in particular Title VII, Title VII cases were tried non-jury. Um, and so many of the decisions made prior to 1991, or for the couple of years subsequent to that, cases were still being tried non-jury, uh, you had a judge deciding admissible evidence um, and deciding what weight um, the judge would give to that admissible evidence and being less concerned about the prejudice of that admissible evidence. Now that we're dealing with um, jury trials in almost all cases, some of those cases that talk about the weight of the evidence may not, simply not be good precedent uh, anymore. Um, the most common types of evidence um, um, is comparative evidence, because we're talking about a disparate treatment case. You treated one group of employees different than another group of employees, or one employee different than a, uh, other employee based on their race, gender, etc. Um, an example in a, in, a, in a gender discrimination case, um, a female employee would typically show that there was a male employee who was similarly situated um, in all relevant respects and was treated materially better, wasn't fired, was hired, was paid more, was promoted. Um, the defendant would show comparative evidence by saying, no, there are also other females who were also paid more than you were or promoted, um, or there were other males who were treated the same or worse than you were. So that's sort of a broad category of fairly typical evidence in employment discrimination cases. The issues come about are, were the individuals similarly situated? Among the questions are, are we talking about individuals who had the same supervisor? Um, were the same standards involved? Was the same conduct involved? Someone was terminated for one form of misconduct, is that applicable to someone who was terminated for another form of misconduct? Um, were there differentiating or mitigating circumstances which show that the employees are really not um, similarly situated? You don't need an exact correlation, but all of those factors will go to either the weight or possibly the admissibility of the evidence of, of in comparators. Um, with respect to the, the issue and the debate we talked about in the context of summary judgment between um, biased remarks, which are either direct evidence or stray comments, um, the courts have looked at a variety of tests to decide sort of on which side they fall. Um, one is the, the ambiguity of the statement. The more ambi uh, ambiguous it is, it may be less probative value. The time between the alleged um, statement um, and the conduct. Um, a supervisor made a racist comment five years ago. Um, or um, is that enough to show that, that race motivated that supervisor in a decision five years later? Um, was it one, a one-off comment of somebody telling a racial joke, or was it a pattern of comments that showed that would show bias? Um, what was the nature of the comment? Was it one that was severe enough to show severe bias, or was it one that perhaps um, didn't rise to that level? Also, who made the statement? Um, was it made by another supervisor who played no role in the decision process, and therefore there's no basis to infer motive from that statement? Was it made by the actual decision maker? Was it in effect adopted by the decision maker? That is, other employees were telling racial jokes, and that supervisor, while not telling them, laughed along with them, suggesting that perhaps um, there was some bias on, on the part of that supervisor. A hard question comes with respect to senior executives. You have uh, racially, um, allegedly racially or gender or age bias statements made by senior executives who may have no role whatsoever in the given employment action um, being challenged. Um, courts will look at that on the one hand. Plaintiffs will argue that shows a culp corporate culture that may pervade the corporation, um, the defendant will say that given manager wasn't making the decision based on that and therefore it's irrelevant that the, um, that the uh, CEO may have an age bias or a gender bias when he played no role in that given decision. Um, the, also you may have um, 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 evidence of racially biased statements being made by someone who, while they didn't make the decision, influenced the decision. Someone who recommended the employment action, someone who investigated the harassment case. All of those may be factors which may allow a statement to be admitted into evidence, uh, even though it's not made by the, the decision maker. Um, on the other hand, corporate culture evidence can be used on the other side to show that um, this manager has gone out of his uh, or her way to treat um, minority employees uh, better, um, has particularly been involved in, act in affirmative action activities. Company-wide demographic statistics may be used affirmatively by the employer to show that um, there isn't any basis to infer discrimination from this particular um, conduct. 
One of the, the, the challenging areas, because there, there are compelling arguments on both sides, deals with uh, what is sometimes called uh, Me Too evidence, another form of comparator, comparator evidence. You have a case involving a given employee who says, I was terminated because of my age. Not as part of a, a broader um, a reduction in force, but an individual case. Um, and he says, I know five other employees that were terminated because of their age, and wants to introduce evidence of those five other employees. On the other hand, the employer says, I have reasons why all of those employees, separate reasons why they were terminated unrelated to their age. Are you going to force me in the context of employee A's case to litigate all five of those other cases and establish in, those, in this case before the jury the good faith basis for those other decisions? And that's the tension um, in that issue of evidence uh, in terms of how far a court should go in allowing that evidence because obviously it can be very prejudicial to the employer. Obviously, there's arguments of, of irrelevancy and, of course, of the uh, burdensomeness. On the other hand, if you're talking about a, a hostile environment sexual harassment case, it's far more likely to be able to show other, evidences, uh, other evidence of, of uh, conduct against others because that may be directly relevant to the question of whether or not the employer created a hostile environment because it's likely if there was a hostile environment created, it was created not just for one employee but on a, on a broader um, basis. Wouldn't you say, Mark, that it's also relevant to the question of whether the employer has got an adequate system to prevent discrimination? Sure. I mean, all of those, all of, in the harassment area, you have all of those issues about the policy, what it's done about the policy, how it's reacted to policy, which may um, provi provide a basis for allowing that evidence. The hard questions are really when you're talking about other individual claims of discrimination that you're forced to litigate in the context of a given case. Um, there, there continues to be litigation over the, the um, role and admissibility of an EEOC determination. As Rick explained, uh, this is not an adjudicative process. Um, based on an adversarial process, but merely a determination of reasonable cause, reason to believe that discrimination may have occurred. Um, we found, particularly in the pre-91 um, cases, courts more willing to allow that evidence in rather than have to decide the question, decide, simply say, I'll decide what weight I'll give it. Um, because of the potential for prejudice, here's a federal agency making a determination that there was reasonable cause, and the, and the possible confusion to the jury of that finding, I think there's a stronger argument now for saying those really should not be admitted into evidence on the reasonable cause. Because the EEOC is essentially eliminating finding no reasonable cause, they don't issue no reasonable cause determinations anymore, you don't have the argument very much on the other side where the employer wants to, to introduce the reasonable, the non-reasonable cause um, uh, finding. Um, to the extent it's, it's admitted into evidence, you then force the employer to have to uh, perhaps litigate the EEOC investigation process to show why that reasonable cause determination shouldn't be given any weight. What did the EEOC do? How did they investigate it? Did, what evidence did they consider that leads to all of that? And try to take discovery about all and take, that. And try and take discovery from the EEOC, exactly, of all of that. Um, other kinds of circumstantial um, um, evidence, um, or at least in a broad category of circumstantial evidence um, that may be uh, admitted and, and raise issues are the fact whether the employer followed its own procedures or policies with respect to um, termination or uh, reductions in force, um, what, how it was documented and when it documented. Was it documented after the fact? Does that go to, to show um, both employer um, motive and bias? Because as we, I think, all recognize in most cases, this is not a question of having direct evidence of discrimination, but trying to infer discrimination from a series of events. Um, on the other hand, again, you have to balance that against potential prejudice for the employer. Um, many employers have very elaborate rules um, and detailed rules, which simply don't get followed, not be for any bias reasons, but because of expediency, relying on individual supervisors to do things, um, simply may not um, follow each of the steps in a given process, not for any uh, improper motive, but simply of part of a normal operation. Um, as we mentioned earlier, statistical evidence is a major um, issue in, in, or can be a major issue in employment cases, particularly those that involve either a, an allegation of a pattern and practice of discrimination, that the allegation that an employer is um, laying off more older workers, um, more women than, um, uh, than males, um, is discriminating in its hiring process against a given category. Those almost by their nature um, call out for statistical evidence because you're talking about a, a pattern of conduct. Um, similarly, in a disparate impact case where the claim is the employer has a neutral policy which has an adverse impact on a protected uh, group, a, a height requirement which would adversely affect certain uh, minorities or women. Um, 
statistics are obviously critical to that kind of case. Um, on the other hand, in an individual case, while statistics may be admissible, they're typically not enough on their own to prove individual discrimination. Um, statistics um, could be a whole separate uh, section of this uh, uh, program, employment statistics alone, because of the very many issues. So I just want to touch on a few of the more um, basic, um, uh, basic issues that relate to statistics. Um, first, when you're talking about comparative statistics, that is, um, what percentage of minorities or women did an employer um, higher. Um, you need to look at um, two cautionary issues. One is you need to, you need to decide what is the appropriate pool to compare them to. The appropriate com pool is those individuals who possess the qualifications for the given job in question. If you're hiring engineers, it's not the what percentage of the workforce in general um, is a particular minority group, but what percentage who, of those who have the appropriate engineering degrees. And there may be some other skills that even narrow the group um, further. Um, secondly, what's the appropriate comparison on the other side? Is it the employer's present workforce? Um, not, um, I think most courts agree that's not the appropriate comparison because those hiring decisions were made over a long period of time, um, and many of which are not um, presently actionable. Um, what we're really talking about is what decisions were made within the relevant time period, um, the hiring that took place within a relevant um, time period as a comparison against what one might have expected to take place during that um, period. Um, then the question that comes up in, in all statistical cases is merely because there is a disparity, is that enough to infer discrimination? Um, the classic example, if you flip a coin 100 times and you get 51 heads, does that imply there's something wrong with the coin? I think we'd all be pretty comfortable saying no. If you flipped it 100 times and it all came up heads, you begin to question the coin. Um, statisticians have developed a, a test for that called standard deviation that says basically um, is it something that was likely to have occurred by chance or is it so far beyond the likelihood that it occurred by chance that I can infer that something else was going on here other than by chance. Um, and the Supreme Court and other courts have adopted a, a basic test that says if there are more than two or three standard deviations in the disparity, that's enough to infer that it is, didn't occur by chance. It may not be enough to infer discrimination, but it's enough to discount chance as the reason which it occurred. Um, in many of the early um, um, employment discrimination cases, you didn't need very s sophisticated statistics because you were really talking about um, an inexorable zero. The employer had no women in the job, that it had no minorities in, in a given job. Um, the, the size of the sample also affects the, the uh, validity of the statistics um, and the question of what factors to consider. Employment decisions are usually based on a multiple of factors. If you're talking about a, a promotion decision, it might be tenure, it might be um, one's education, it might be one's performance ratings. All of those factors um, may go into the, to the equation and therefore one common technique used is a multiple regression analysis which allows all of the various factors to be considered simultaneously to determine, so you're in effect comparing people who are similarly situated. There the debate goes over the question of factors which weren't included, whether they material, do they affect the results, can you rely on the given equation um, that's, that's being offered by the particular expert. Um, one very brief uh, comment, because I think it's, it's critical um, in the employment area, has to do with Rule 4, 412, um, dealing with um, evidence um, related to sexual misconduct. Obviously this would come up most frequently in sexual harassment cases. Um, the rule bars evidence which is offered to prove the alleged victim engaged in other sexual behavior or to prove alleged victim's sexual predisposition. There's an exception to the rule for civil litigation when it's otherwise admissible if the probative value substantially outweighs the danger of harm to the victim um, and of unfair prejudice to the, um, the party in question. Um, victim's reputation is only admissible if placed in controversy by the alleged victim. Um, the Rule 412 also sets up a procedure uh, by which such evidence uh, has to be uh, offered. Thanks, Mark. Rick, even management lawyers are willing to concede that a whole lot of cases have issued uh, where plaintiffs uh, have received relief. In the remaining eight or so minutes, nine minutes, would you devote some attention to uh, the various forms of relief available to plaintiffs in employment litigation, including attorney's fees? Okay, first there's, uh, take Title VII as, in, as an example, there's injunctive relief. There are basically two kinds of injunctive relief. Individualized relief that restore the individual to the position that he or she would have been in absent discrimination. And that can be instatement, reinstatement, promotion, hiring, a uh, variety of things. Uh, and there's general injunctive relief. You see general injunctive relief most often in class, ca uh, class actions 
or government pattern and practice cases. Sometimes there are some forms of general relief that are handed down in individual cases, such as an order that may require that harassment complaints be dealt with differently from here on out. The, um, uh, uh, there are general standards with respect to the orders. The court has to craft the order in a way that minimizes the burden on others. There may be some burden on others that can't be avoided, but you try to minimize the burden on others. Uh, where you have a large-scale case and it may not be possible to determine which particular individual would have received a promotion in the absence of um, uh, discrimination, uh, the back pay can be shared around among them in what's called a class-wide or pro-rata approach. And basically the courts will accept any reasonable proposal by any of the parties for determining which individuals should receive the uh, instatement for the number of positions. There can be goals and timetables requiring race or gender conscious uh, relief with respect to hiring and promotions in cases that demonstrate the kind of strong record that's required for those cases. Uh, Wendy has already covered fully the uh, questions of uh, back pay and the uh, dispute about collateral benefits, the elements of back pay and so forth. Uh, Prejudgment interest these days is customarily awarded. Uh, there uh, is not a bright line rule for what is the rate of interest that should be used for prejudgment interest. Plaintiffs like the Internal Revenue Service rates compounded annually. Um, sometimes we like to argue that they should be compounded daily. Uh, but the court has a broad range of rates to go to. The state rule for prejudgment interest is not necessarily going to be followed in the federal court. Uh, front pay compensates the plaintiff for the, uh, well, two different situations. One of them is uh, there's a, it is a given that injunctive relief does not require the displacement of even a person who is favored by discrimination. There may be civil service rules that do that, but it's not generally done under the fair employment laws. So the plaintiff may have to wait until the next vacancy occurs in order to get the job that would have been the plaintiff's if there had been no discrimination. Front pay compensates for the difference in uh, compensation between the plaintiff's present job and the uh, job that the plaintiff is in the waiting list for. There can also be front pay when the plaintiff has been discharged or uh, is no longer able to work uh, with the employer until the plaintiff finds a suitable other job. As with a duty to mitigate, the plaintiff is not required to change careers, to take a demeaning job. Uh, there's a rule of reason that uh, operates on that. The duration of a front pay award uh, is something that depends to some extent upon the uniqueness of the job, the uniqueness of the skill set of the plaintiff. Uh, Customarily, a uh, front pay award will run from one to two years. The largest one I know involved a train dispatcher for a large commuter railroad in New York City. There were only four jobs like it in the country, and that individual got 20 years of front pay, but that is a very unusual case. <laughs> the liquidated damages that are available under the Age Discrimination and Employment Act and the uh, uh, Family and Medical Leave Act, Equal Pay Act, uh, the ADEA and the EPA use a different standard from the Family and Medical Leave Act. Uh, the liquidated damages are available under the ADEA and the EPA if the violation is willful. That follows pretty much the same standard as is followed with respect to the availability of punitive damages under Title VII and the Americans with Disabilities Act. Under the FMLA, there's a statutory standard that there is no liquidated damages if the employer acted in good faith and had reasonable grounds for believing that its conduct was not a violation, but those are not the same standards. Um, under the 1991 uh, Civil Rights Act, Wendy already covered the fact that there are caps based upon the number of employees. What does one do with respect to an employment agency or a union? There's been very little uh, answers so far in the cases since the 1991 Act. Um, uh, it may be that uh, unions very seldom engage in discrimination, but of course there are some cases, but just not ones that have addressed this question. One cannot mention the caps to the jury. The judge district judge is not allowed to do it and counsel are not allowed to do it and uh, breaking that rule may be prejudicial to the other side and require a retrial on damages. The caps apply to the combination of uh, compensatory and punitive damages. Now if the defendant is a public sector employer, state, local, or federal, there are no punitive damages that are available because that's uh, prohibited by federal common law and it's specifically prohibited by the 1991 Civil Rights Act. Um, the 91 Act says that a plaintiff in a case who's also suing under, that a plaintiff can recover damages under Title VII if the plaintiff is unable to recover under Section 1981. In practice, that has been applied uh, 
uh, to allow plaintiffs to bring suit under both Title VII and Section 1981 and then uh, uh, choose which damage award to accept. But there cannot be double recovery. The caps have uh, generally been held by those circuits to address it as applying to each claimant, not to a claim. So for example, if a plaintiff has one lawsuit involving sexual harassment and another lawsuit involving retaliation, whether or not they're ever consolidated, the plaintiff is held to uh, the cap, a uh, single cap, an aggregate for all of the claims. Uh, no court has yet, no court of appeals at least, has yet addressed the question what happens if there's a violation uh, separated in time. Uh, another act of sexual harassment, say, that occurs some years later, there may be another uh, cap for that. But the basic rule is the cap is per claimant, not per claim. On, to get compensatory damages, the plaintiff has to prove that there is some injury, a simple technical violation. And, uh, for example, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, employers are not allowed to ask some questions before there is a conditional job offer. If the employer asks the questions too early, that does not by itself injure. Uh, the plaintiff and the courts have held that the plaintiff is not entitled to compensatory damages for that. Personal testimony is accepted as a basis for compensatory damages by many courts, but pretty much all courts agree that if that testimony is too vague and conclusory, it bothered me a lot, uh, that's not going to be enough. Damages can be sought against state and, state and local officials in their personal capacities, not under Title VII or the ADA but under 42 U.S.C. Section 1983, and there's the defense of qualified immunity available to that. Section 1983 is also available uh, where the plaintiff can prove that discrimination, intentional discrimination, was the official policy of the municipality. Um, Section 1983 is not available against states. Punitive damages, um, uh, the Supreme Court in the Colstad case held that there is no egregiousness requirement, but that the plaintiff does have to show that there should be vicarious liability under the facts of this case for the acts of supervisors. The most common, uh, there are several grounds for vicarious liability. The most commonly used is that the discrimination took place uh, because of an agent acting in a managerial capacity in the scope of employment. With respect to that very common situation, the employer has a good faith defense available, i.e., uh, that it was. Um, uh, uh, taking reasonable steps to make sure that it and all of its uh, managers complied with the law. Uh, the courts that have uh, been construing this have generally say, held that an employer that knowingly conceals evidence of discrimination, for example, burying a report done by a consultant indicating that there are massive problems, or that uh, falsely communicates the basis for the action and lies about the action, uh, uh, does not qualify for the good faith defense and that does qualify for uh, an award of punitive damages. The failure to respond to a complaint of discrimination has been held to qualify and an inappropriate response, i.e. going after the complainant rather than uh, trying to find out whether the conduct occurred, qualifies. But supposing the employer takes longer than the plaintiff likes to do the investigation, there may be good reasons for that by itself, uh, at least in the case where an employer ultimately uh, did an adequate investigation and took adequate action, that does not qualify for any punitive damages. A good faith uh, effort to comply has to involve not just a paper policy, but actual implementation of the policy. And now we have the subject of attorney's fees, if we have time for that. Mr. Zinnever, do we have time for that? Rick, uh, I, I promise I will not consider this a waiver of the right to receive attorney's fees for prevailing <laughs> parties. <laughs> However, we are out of time. Uh, and and I'll, I'll duly note that attorney's fees are availing to a prevailing plaintiff, are available to a prevailing plaintiff, and under a Christiansburg standard, a more stringent standard to a prevailing defendant. But that's our program for today. We hope you found it useful. I want to again thank our faculty for explaining this complicated subject so clearly. A couple of things before we go. Please remember that the written materials for this program are available on the FJC website as well as the one-page evaluation forms. Please fill these out and fax them back to us at the number at the bottom of the form. They are the only way for us to know if you found this program useful and how we might improve it. Also on the web at www.abanet.org labor, you will find selected chapters of basic equal employment opportunity law and procedures. This is a very helpful reference. And finally, in addition to those resources, the ABA Labor and Employment Law section, in conjunction with the Bureau of National Affairs, 
are offering a free CD-ROM copy of the Seymour and Aslan Equal Employment Opportunity, Equal Employment Law update, and this is uh, Rick Seymour, our own Rick Seymour. You can get your free CD-ROM either by writing Chris Meacham at the American Bar Association section of Labor and Employment Law at 750 North Lakeshore Drive, Chicago, Illinois, 60611, or by going to the section's website at laboremploymentlaw at abanet.org for the Federal Judicial Center and the American Bar Association's Labor and Employment Law section. I am Pete Zinnaber. Goodbye.